Scotland's Most Wanted, The Dark Secrets of the Gillespie Empire. In the shadowy heart of 2002 Glasgow, where houses stand close like whispering secrets, a dangerous scuffle ignites in one of them, unnoticed by the unsuspecting neighborhood. A towering figure barges into the house and draws a gun, ready to shoot the man of the house point blank. However, the gun jams. Undeterred, the attacker pulls out a knife, determined to execute the task he's set on. But standing before him is not just any man, but a master of combat. He swiftly disarms the intruder and stabs him in the neck, thwarting the second attempt on his life. Breathless from the clash, the man with the target on his head slips into the night, believing he's left Glasgow and danger behind. Little does he know that in the underworld, there's only so far you can run when your number's up, especially when you've gotten on the wrong side of the notorious Gillespie Escobar Brothers of Scotland. Welcome to Narcotic Underworld. Today, we delve deeper into the horrors of the Gillespie brothers that shook the Scottish streets and flooded the country with drugs and violence. The unfortunate man in the Glasgow home is Martin Toner, a drug dealer himself and one of many victims of Gillespie brothers. The brothers finally got to him in 2004 with his decomposing dead body found in a farm field, stabbed 12 times and his throat cut. Brace yourselves as we unravel the sinister tapestry of this murder and plunge deeper into the abyss of the Gillespie brothers' empire. Gillespie, a name signifying strings of drugs and guns. The story of Gillespie brothers, that of cocaine flood, street shootings, and gruesome murders in Scotland starts from a long fall. It was 1998 when the local drug lord, Stephen Dougherty, plummeted to his death from the 21st floor of a tower block. That event proved to be striking gold for James and Barry Gillespie, who took over the reins of the drug trade of Rutherglen first and then of the whole of Scotland. The sibling duo grew up in the rough, poverty-stricken Glasgow suburban Rutherglen Starting off as street dealers, they soon became Scotland's most notorious criminals. James Gillespie, 50 years of age, is the eldest and is 1.82 meters tall with medium build and dark hair. Barry Gillespie, 46, is 1.78 meters tall with stocky build and dark hair. While the details about their family life or upbringing are not widely known, they're known to have been grown up as tough street fighters, a phenomenon not uncommon in the poverty-riddled Glasgow suburbs. The brothers got fame soon for their short fuses. Keeping up with their notoriety, they garnered millions worth of drug business, distributed illegal guns, and even orchestrated international assassinations sometimes. They erected a robust drug-dealing empire with presence in Scotland, Portugal, and South America. In the initial years of their rampant crime career, they posed as property developers and lived under aliases. James lived as Stephen Taylor or James Gardner, while Barry pretended to be Eamon Fitzpatrick. Staying undercover from the authorities, they kept coordinating international shipments of coke and illegal weapons. The brothers escaped to Portugal's Algarve in 2008 to avoid an exploding gang war while continuing their operations. While they carved a notorious reputation in Scotland, the Gillespie crime empire reached its zenith in Portugal. However, the drastic transition from a poverty-struck town to a luxury estate in Portugal gave birth to speculations regarding the brothers' activities. The climax? 2009, when a truck from a Scots haulage firm got intercepted in Montpellier, France. The French authorities caught 1,500 hidden boxes of 684 kilos of the stash was hidden among a load of cash registers and coffee. The value of this was over a whopping 31 million pounds. It was the biggest ever drug seizure by the French authorities. 
However, the brothers blamed the bust on a person named John Jackson, a former associate of dead gangster Stuart Specky Boyd, who was tasked to ensure the truck's safe return to the UK. In the narcotic underworld, it's an unwritten rule that if someone is in possession of a drug consignment and it gets lost, that person is still responsible for paying the bill. A lost shipment isn't written down or cut off as experience, and when the consignment is of this high value, losing it does become a nightmare. Many people thought the brothers would be done after this loss but they bounced back with a crime empire. They rose to create Scotland's most dangerous and richest organized crime syndicate with international connections and reach across from the Netherlands to Spain. The Gillespie Empire was also a rising force in South America. The crime empire was thriving so much that according to a source, it would be hard to find a gram of cocaine in Scotland that the Gillespies haven't made money from. The brothers made a multi-million pound fortune from this large yet dark empire. They're known to have a stranglehold over Scotland's supply chain, similar to the infamous South American Narcos networks. Slowly but gradually, they came to the helm of the flood chain and started running Scotland while creating a multi-million pound fortune. Their drug operation extended to cannabis, and other substances. One of the reasons they superseded other gangs was the adoption of high-end counter surveillance tech. They used customized cars with hidden hydraulic-powered compartments used to keep semi-automatic weapons. In case of a police chase, they would block phone signals via phone jamming equipment. They had their own tech specialists. Being cautious of their security, the Gillespie brothers were among the criminals who used encrypted phones. Initially, the brothers were clients of Netcom. However, they didn't want to rely on someone else for their security. Taking matters in their own hands, they created their own devices. Developers were hired to develop a custom operating system. They distributed the devices to the groups as well and started selling the phones for business under a venture called MPC. This venture later brought the fall of the criminal-turned-crime blogger Martin Koch. The Gillespie brothers were, according to the police, financiers of the encryption service MPC, which advertised on Vlinder's crime by Martin Koch. We'll delve deeper into these details later in the video. Stay tuned to watch. MPC started its digital marketing campaigns in 2016. The company even used black and white images of whistleblower Edward Snowden to catch the attention of privacy-cautious clientele. MPC phones claim to have multiple levels of encryption over a closed, secure network. The company had overseas presence as well. One of MPC's employees' business cards included an address in a downtown Dubai office and phone numbers with the UAE country code. Moreover, the company created new companies regularly and then dismantled them. Several companies in the UK database company's house were linked to MPC. While their names were slightly different from the main company name, they had the same registration address. A few linked companies were registered in Amsterdam as well. With an encrypted phone company, a thriving multinational drug trade empire, and a reign of terror to perpetuate control, things were looking good for the brothers. But then, 2018 came, bringing along bad tidings for the Scottish Narcos duo. The police locked up nine members of their gang for 87 years for drug and gun crimes after which a long police hunt began for the underworld sibling duo. They were named on the indictment as orchestrators of the offenses. However, they didn't face charges. The convicted men included cocaine baron Mark Richardson, who was the brother's major source of drug distribution in Scotland. He was sentenced to eight years for gun offenses. Whereas Martin Fitzsimmons was jailed for possessing ammo, a Glock handgun, and 36,000 pounds worth of dirty money. 
This was possible after a series of raids in Glasgow and Lanarkshire. The police seized 11 guns and 1.6 million pounds during these raids. The gun included Glock pistols, a Heckler & Koch submachine gun, and an M75 hand grenade. The recovered money was believed to be a pending payment to the Gillespie network every week. However, dirty money, drugs, and guns were not the only offenses the brothers were involved in. They were implicated in some very gruesome acts of violence, including murders. The Gillespie Reign of Terror One such harrowing act was the murder of Martin Toner in 2004. Pollock Shields, Glasgow, Toner ran a bin cleaning company. He went missing in June. He was last sighted on June 29, 2004 in Langbank's Main Street. His body was found in a farm field in Langbank, Renfrewshire on July 13 with 12 stabbings and his throat cut. According to the police, he was killed somewhere else after which his body was dumped into the field. Toner was scheduled to appear at the High Court in Edinburgh on cocaine smuggling charges. However, he went missing the day before his appearance. A former policeman named Douglas Fleming was charged with the murder in 2015, but released later after the charge couldn't be proved. Toner's wife speculated that Gillespie brothers might have something to do with his death. It wasn't the first time Toner's life came under threat. In 2002, James Gillespie barged into his house and attempted to shoot him point blank, but couldn't because his gun jammed. He pulled out a knife, but Martin disarmed him. After this scary run-in, Martin left Scotland only to return in 2003. Moreover, Toner's wife told the court that when he heard the brothers had come back, he was fuming. He was sensing some trouble from the brothers, apparently. However, the tale of horrendous violence by the Gillespie brothers does not end here. In 2015, another drug dealer became the victim of Gillespie torture. Robert Allen was unable to pay the gang 30,000 pounds in connection with <laughs> shipment. Dreading the wrath of the Underlords, he fled Scotland and moved to Barnsley, South Yorkshire. However, he was traced and the gang members broke into his house. His chest, arms, and ankle were bound together with a chain. Allen's ordeal didn't end here. He was bundled into a van and driven to a deserted industrial unit in Faldhouse, Midlothian. He was kicked, punched, and whipped with a thick chain for two days. His captors smacked him with a metal bar and battered him with a 14-pound sledgehammer, breaking his leg. Then he was ordered to strip and had bleach sprayed on him. His pain was exponential as the liquid penetrated his wounds. This still wasn't the end, as Allen was taken to a rural place near East Kilbride, South Lanarkshire. He was shot three times, two shots in one knee and one in the other. He was then dragged up to the hilltop and was ordered to roll down. The poor man was then rushed to the hospital by members of the public. Robert Allen miraculously survived this dreadful ordeal and agreed to testify against the attackers. He was placed on a witness protection program and given a new identity. The perpetrators of the abduction and attempted murder stood trial. The Gillespies were connected with this case when a fresh appeal by the police was announced, citing the brothers' involvement in it. Another notable incident of violence tied to the Gillespie brothers is the murder of Dutch convict turned crime blogger Martin Koch in 2016. The Gillespies served Martin Koch a platter to Macro Mafia, specifically its leader, Ridwan Toggi. This time, their company MPC was directly involved in the murder. The encrypted phone company reached out to him for marketing. It was a lucrative offer, as the company had already paid Martin 13,000 euros. Coke did a few posts and videos with MPC's hats and shirts for promotion. However, it turned out later that this was a trap. 
Martin was shot several times outside an Amsterdam sex club on December 8, 2016. Christopher Hughes, a Gillespie henchman, was with him that day, as well as several months leading up to the tragedy. Hughes later admitted before an informant that Coke's murder was planned and executed at the behest of the brothers as a gift for Toggy. The crime blogger had gotten on the wrong side of the Macro Mafia when he published the names of Toggy and his two partners Richard Rico R and now Fall Nafalev, a practice uncommon in crime reporting. His life came under threat before as well. In 2015, a shooting attempt rendered his car riddled with bullet holes, but he maintained that he had faced tougher challenges and wasn't scared. From Willem Holleder, the Philippines, in the Ocean, in the Had I a Philippia on the website. For all the names of everyone on the table, there were some people who were not happy with it. I was used to 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 it. Jawel, maar ik, ben, ik heb ze zelf ook vroeger vastgezeten. Dus, uh, en daar word je ook niet echt beter van. Dus uh, als, als ze betalen. Goed. Uh, we, we, we zijn wel iets meer gewend, toch? Van Funderskraan, toch? Van het hele, hele vuur staan. Dus een pak kool gaat, dat maak je mij niet bang mee, toch? En je hebt niks gehoord? Niks gehoord. Recognizing their eminent capture, the brothers vanished from Portugal. After months of this hunt, the police obtained European arrest warrants for the Gillespie brothers and three of their henchmen in 2019. They were accused of ordering shootings, stabbings, and slashing. The three henchmen included Jordan Owen, who was involved in the fatal shooting of Jamie Lee in 2018, and ex Combus Lang Rangers manager Paul McCall in February 2018. He was also a suspect in the slashing of Joe Shields, a criminal lawyer, in July 2018. Owen was detained in Portuguese capital Lisbon in December 2019 and was extradited to the UK in 2020. He was jailed for life in 2022 with at least 23 years of jail term. The other wanted henchman was James White, who reportedly arranged meetings between the Gillespies and their associate. He had links to Benendorm in Spain. White was extradited in Brazil in 2022 and sentenced to nine years and 10 months for serious organized crime and firearm offenses. The third henchman was Christopher Hughes, who was wanted as a suspect for the murder of Dutch crime blogger Martin Koch in 2016. Hughes was convicted and jailed for life in 2022. However, the police weren't this lucky when it came to the duo. They continued to try locate them, but they couldn't lay their hands on them, even when 200 specialist cops were set to chase the Kingpin brothers. The Crime Stoppers announced the reward of £5,000 against each brother for anyone who shared information useful to their arrest. Their last whereabouts was a Brazilian bolt hole. They were hiding in Fortaleza, the capital of Sierra State in the northeast of Brazil. However, their hideout was quite a lavish one, especially when they had 200 cops sniffing after them and the European authorities keeping their eyes peeled to find them. Posing as wealthy tourists, the duo was living in a plush apartment worth 320,000 pounds overlooking sublime Praia do Morales Beach a four-bedroom waterfront air-conditioned apartment, five bedrooms, a barbecue, a balcony, and a private swimming pool. Not bad for a bull toll, right? The fact that they were able to afford it while apparently the world was closing in on them shows how higher they were in the upper echelon of the drug world. However, they suddenly went off the radar and didn't even contact their close friends and family. The authorities were forced to believe that they met their demise in their presumably safe haven. It was corroborated by their associate James the Don White. Having been extradited from Fortaleza, he pled guilty to a series of organized crimes. He also revealed before the informants that he hadn't heard from his bosses for a long time. He also told that he had taken over Scotland's biggest cocaine, dirty cash, and weapons gangs. But 
what happened to the duo, actual demise or just the facade. Imagine two guys on the run, but passing their days quite comfortably while their associates are being caught left and right. All the luxury and staying ahead of the police points towards one sign. They're being protected. And that, too, by someone big in Brazil. Authorities believe that the Gillespie brothers have protection from a Brazilian gang. But this protection is at a price, as nothing comes for free in the underworld. That's one transactional rule applicable in the real world, too. Nevertheless, the Gillespie brothers are ostensibly paying local gangsters protection money. Reportedly, the Kingpin siblings were paying through their noses. It still wasn't enough for the local thugs. Eventually, the brothers were maxed out, leading to a fallout with the locals. One brother was held hostage by the thugs, while the other was sent off to fill up a case with cash. Things had come full circle for the Gillespies, or some would call it poetic justice. Nevertheless, the authorities told the fugitive duo's relatives that they might have come to harm while on the run. As of August 2023, they're believed to be executed by the gang. Nobody has heard from them for a while now, which is unusual because they remained in touch with some of their trusted friends and family. They've been removed from the National Crime Agency's Most Wanted Gallery. The Crime Stoppers has also withdrawn its £10,000 reward for information leading to the duo's arrest. While their execution is widely believed to have occurred, some people don't agree. Many believe them to be alive, and the rumors of their death as a ruse to get the cops off their case. Chris Pickard, an author who wrote the autobiography of iconic robber Ronnie Biggs, is one of them. The author of Great Train Robber, which covers Britain's most notorious heist, maintains that the Gillespie brothers could still be alive and well in the South American bolt hole. He insists that Brazil is a massive country. Given the size of the country, you could disappear anywhere over there. The brothers could so easily by now have had someone fix them up with papers that make it look like they have the right to work and live in Brazil. Given how well supplied with funds and well connected they were, this seems to be a possibility. Besides, what else can be a smart way to get the authorities off your back than to spread rumors of your death? However, Chris believes that the guys wouldn't be living in Fortaleza anymore. They might have moved down south to Salvador or Recife posing as tourists. He insists that if the pair were to move further south in Sao Paulo, they would get by easily. There have been a lot of major crimes who have been found after living for many years in Brazil, he says. Have their actions finally caught up with the Gillespie brothers or they managed to put up a facade? Let us know what you think.